Dr. Mary Ruart is um, the author of uh, these two books, Short Answers to Tough Questions in Healing Our World. And she's been involved in the Libertarian Party since the early 80s. And um, I'm looking forward to what she has to say about the future of the Libertarian Movement. Well, thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's good to be here. And I know a lot of you probably are familiar with me, but a lot aren't. And you may be wondering, what qualifies me to talk about the future of the libertarian movement? So I'm going to do a really quick run-through on the things I've done, just so that you know uh, if whether or not you can then make the decision, whether or not I have credibility in your eyes to talk about this topic. So, for example, um, I started in the Libertarian Party back when I started. That was really the only gateway into the movement. I've been a candidate over a dozen times in state and local races. I've been a ballot access sign uh, uh, signature gatherer. I've run for the LP presidential and VP nomination. And I've served as an at-large member for three terms. I've been very involved in nonprofit Libertarian foundations as board members for Heartland, uh, I'm now chairing the um, International Society for Individual Liberty, and I'm secretary for the Foundation for a Free Society. I'm also the author, as my introducer shared with you, of Healing Our World uh, and Short Answers to the Tough Questions, both of which are available at the registration desk. And I'm currently working on a book about pharmaceutical regulation, the topic I talked about yesterday. I've been involved with the Ron Paul um, movement. Actually, I've been involved with Ron Paul for a long time. He's endorsed Healing Our World uh, and my bid for the FDA commissioner position uh, back about 15 years ago. And I appear in the For Liberty film about the Ron Paul revolution. Now, I only mention these things because I want you to take what I say seriously. Obviously, it's up to you whether you want to act on it. But here's my take. My take, after all this experience in so many different facets of the liberty movement, is there is no silver bullet. We keep looking for one, and I just don't think it's there. I think it's going to be a marketplace of ideas and attempts at liberty, all of which will contribute something. And at some point, there may be one or two that become the fulcrum, the tipping point. Uh, but it will not be because those things are out there by their lonesome. It will be because of the foundation that's been built up uh, in a number of areas. And these are the areas I want to talk to you about today. Um, and I'll go through them one by one, so I'm not going to go through this slide now. First of all, let's talk about projects like the Free State. This is the kind of thing we need to be doing, projects, right? And there's a bunch of them. In fact, I'm, I'm not listing them all. I'm just putting down some that I'm familiar with. And, uh, you know, seasteading, of course, you may have heard about that, building a platform in the ocean. Uh, Blue Seed, which is actually an immigration solution to rent a cruise ship and put would-be entrepreneurs who would like to be immigrants but aren't allowed into the country because there's really no path for an entrepreneur to get in. And this is going to be off the bay, uh, San Francisco Bay with access to Silicon Valley, so it'll probably be mostly the tech industry. It's not in place yet, but it was uh, featured on John Stossel just a couple weeks ago. And of course, economic free zones in a number of countries are being um, started or attempted to be started. And there's been actually a number of attempts, I'd say a half a dozen serious attempts, to start new countries. Um, anywhere from a coral reef in the ocean to um, buying a piece of land from an established country. But they've all kind of gone down because the statist regimes have decided that they didn't want that no matter what. So. We need projects, and Free State is doing their thing, and I think that's a wonderful addition to this portfolio of things that we need to succeed. Now, I want to talk about the Libertarian Party. I have spent a lot of time there. Uh, it used to be the only gateway into the movement back when I started in the early 80s. That is thankfully no longer the case. Uh, and I say thankfully because I, I fear that the Libertarian Party has, in my opinion, gone astray a little bit. We are trying to soft sell the message oftentimes. I just don't think that that's appropriate. I mean, Ron Paul activated a lot of the youth by having a pretty hardcore message. 
Now is the time to step forward and be radical. If we soft sell the message, people are going to say, well, why shouldn't we just vote for Ron Paul Republicans instead of Libertarian Party members? It, it makes no logical sense to soft sell at this time. You know, in, in the 80s when I started, we didn't have all these studies to back us up. So when we went and we said, uh, you know, that the drug war was a bad thing, and it was immoral, we didn't have the statistics to show that it kills more people than the, than the drugs themselves. Now we have all this wonderful data. There's just no excuse to uh, soft sell the message. And I think the Libertarian Party has gotten so focused on winning office that they've missed the winning hearts and minds part. And I think that that's going to hurt us. And part of the reason it's going to hurt us is I'm not sure that we can easily win office because I believe that the wasted vote syndrome is much more severe than we ever thought it was. In 2008, Ron Paul was the only third, uh, only Liberty candidate. I should, shouldn't say only third party candidate. That's actually not accurate. He was the only Liberty candidate on the ballot in Louisiana. And that's because the LP didn't get their signatures in on time. So. There was no competition. If you wanted to vote for Liberty, Ron Paul was the only one. And he was first or second in the Republican primary there. So he should have gotten a lot of votes. Instead, he only got 0.5%, which is the same amount he got as our 1988 presidential candidate, and about the same amount that the LP presidential candidate got that year. In other words, even Ron Paul supporters, who generally tend to be very fervent, voted for the lesser of two evils if they felt their candidate couldn't win. This was a big blow to see this because the wasted vote syndrome is, is much bigger, I think, than we had anticipated. Now, <laughs> so one might say, well, then we need to run as major party candidates. Well, at least at the presidential level, uh, this is very, very difficult. Uh, for those of you who followed the last run that Ron Paul did for president, you know that the rule was that you had to win five primary states in order to be nominated. And Ron Paul got that. And then they changed the rules to make it, I can't remember if it was seven or nine, eight, okay. They changed the rules to make it eight at the last minute so he had no chance to uh, change, you know, he had no chance to try to get those other critical three states. Um, and that was purposeful. Also, there's a lot of, a lot of concern about whether votes are accurately counted. And uh, I've given you a couple of references. Uh, the documentary Hacking Democracy goes through why we should be suspicious of vote totals. And it, you can find it at blackboxvoting.org. If you haven't seen that, I highly recommend it. It's kind of an eye opener. Again, it's, it's a little bit discouraging. It's especially uh, discouraging when you realize that Statists understand that it's important not who votes, but who counts the votes. Here's a quote by Stalin, uh, which basically says that. So it makes you very suspicious. And I personally, in my career, have seen a lot of voter fraud. Uh, I was the campaign manager for a, a sheriff candidate in Kentucky one year. And our candidate was allowed to watch the vote counting. And he said every single ballot box had the seal broken, and the matching seal wasn't even there. It was a different seal. Clearly, the votes had been tampered with. He was told by his friends, three of his friends, that they had voted absentee for him. And yet, he only got one absentee vote. So clearly, there were some problems with that election. There are problems in who counts the votes. So what, what, can we, what can we do? What do we do with this information? Well, think about what if we actually elected someone to Congress? What if the LP, and I know the LP may not be as active here as it is in other states, but kind of follow along with me because I think the conclusion is going to be something you're going to be excited about. What if we actually elected someone to Congress as, as a Libertarian Party candidate? What would happen? Well, I don't think much would happen. We'd get our 15 minutes of fame, but that one person, or even two people, they would not be able to change the course of Congress any more than Ron Paul had been able to, because Congress is ruled by a majority vote, too. So 
we would have somebody on the inside who could alert us to more Patriot Acts coming down the road, but as far as actually rolling back big government because they were elected, probably not. So even if the LP focused all its resources on getting congressional candidates elected, I'm not sure that it would do the trick. So where do we go? We have to ask ourselves, what do we, where do we really want to put our resources? Do we want to try to elect members to Congress? Or do we want to roll back big government today? Yeah, now I know it's kind of funny, but actually the LP is very good at rolling back big government today, and I want to share some of this with you that you might not have even been aware of. It's a lesson that I should have learned in the early 80s because I was involved in something that taught that lesson, but I didn't get it. Well, I finally woke up, and I want to share it with you now. So let me take you back to the early 80s, when we had to do all of our brochures by hand instead of by the computer. This is the olden days. And uh, you can see that a group of us in Kalamazoo ran for city commission. And uh, there I am. And Cheryl Laux, who was a big player in this. And what we did is we ran for city commission as a slate, because that was the way you did it for city commission. There was the establishment slate, which was the one that was already elected, and there were two others. And uh, we came actually in second, which was amazing. But what was even more amazing was that we got those votes in spite of the fact of what the media did to us. Now, this was supposed to be a nonpartisan city commission election. But, of course, four of us on the slate were Libertarian Party members, and the other one on the slate was a current elected member, Francis Hamilton, and he was actually what we would call today a small L libertarian. Okay, so the media decided that they would take us down because we were calling ourselves the taxpayers' protection slate. We wanted to lower taxes, property taxes. That was our big thing. Obviously, the city didn't like that too much. So they thought they would take us down by telling everyone that we were libertarian. And back then, since nobody really knew what a libertarian was, they tried to distort our positions and talked about the whole range of things that really have nothing to do with a city commission race, but they thought would taint us. So, of course, in self-defense, we had to talk about these positions too. So the voters of Kalamazoo got an education as to what a libertarian was. And anyone who was paying attention to that election understood what a libertarian was by the end of that election. So that's why I say it was actually quite surprising. We still came in second. But the real lesson came after that. What happened is the city, uh, the city commission, excited because they had won again, decided they would, they would uh, give us the big tax boondoggle that they ever had. What they intended to do was have railroad consolidation. Now, you got to think about Kalamazoo, not even 100,000 people. And they were worried because sometimes we had to wait 10 minutes for a train to go by. So they were going to reroute all of the trains in a very expensive um, cloverleaf like you see with um, highways, which we had none of, of course. And they were going to do this by having the biggest tax that we've ever had and they were going to use eminent domain to take the land. Well, of course, as libertarians, we went to one of the citizen meetings about this. And one gentleman came up to me, an older gentleman, and he put $200 in cash in my hand. This is back in the 1980s, so what is that worth, about $600 today? And he said, Dr. Ruart, I want you to take this money and I want you to fight this rail consolidation and this eminent domain because they're going to take my bicycle shop, the one that my brother and I built up over all the years. And he said, Dr. Ruart, I know your employer, Upjohn, is going to get some of that land. But Dr. Ruart, you are a libertarian. He said, I know whose side you're on. You're on my side. And he walked away. Now here I had a big conflict of interest going, right? <laughs> and yet, this gentleman was sure 
that because I was a libertarian, I was going to be on his side, and I wasn't going to sit back. I was going to be active and take his side. And what I should have learned from that is how powerful a campaign is, how powerful it is to actually talk about the message, and how it influences people, how it gives them hope, and how then, when big government comes knocking at their door, who do they call? The libertarians. And we actually did go and help fight that with some other concerned citizens, and we, we did defeat it. It was wonderful. But you know, that victory, as wonderful and sweet as it was, wasn't considered to be much of a victory by the Libertarian Party as a whole. And yet libertarians all over the country were rolling back taxes, stopping eminent domain, uh, making sure that bad regulations were not passed. This was happening everywhere. And yet the Libertarian Party considered itself a failure because they weren't electing people. But they were rolling back big government right then and there. And that's the lesson that I should have learned, and, and I wish the party had learned, because this is what we should be doing. We're actually good at that. And if you want to get elected, how do you do it? You become well-known among your friends and neighbors for helping out. You become their hero or heroine. You could bet if I had run for city commission the next year that I would have gotten the vote of the people who own that bicycle shop, and they would have campaigned for me right? Because that's what you do. You vote for your heroes and heroines. So ironically, by focusing on local activism and being the ghostbusters, if you will, for big government, we can get the kind of uh, loyalty that inspires voting. So it, it kind of works both ways. Now, you might say, okay, that's good at the local level, but does that really happen in other ways? Well, I want to share some other things you might not be aware of. This one I think you will be. LP member Steve Cubby organized Prop 215 in California in 1996. This was the first medical marijuana law that passed. This is California's medical marijuana law, and that has had repercussions. Other states now have passed medical marijuana laws, I think half about half the states have, and two have decriminalized marijuana totally. Now, this is very important because most of, the, over half of the drug war, uh, I'm going to say that half of the victims that are in jail uh, are there for marijuana possession. So if the marijuana laws goes down, the drug war goes down too. So this is very significant. So at the state level, this can happen. Well, how about at other levels? Well, and in Georgia, Carol Ann Rand ran as a libertarian, and she defeated Republican incumbent Bob Barr. She knocked him right out of his own primary just by running advertisements. You know what these advertisements were? A medical marijuana patient, an old lady in bed saying, Bob Barr wants to take away my medicine. Why do you want to do that to me, Bob? <laughs> he went down in flames. <laughs> and if you don't think that rolled back big government uh, and, and scared some of the drug warriors. Now, there's another incident that you may not be aware of, but I am because I worked in it. Clinton care was largely defeated in 93 by the libertarians. How do I know this? I was active in that arena, and I would look in the newspaper and read uh, the authors of the studies or the critics, and I knew 80% of them. They were in the libertarian movement. And we went on the radio and television, we wrote, and I, I, my, my co-author of Lethal Compassion, The Cure That Kills, um, which was about Clinton Care. Uh, went on the radio and actually debated with one of the biggest proponents of Clinton Care and basically showed the radio audience he hadn't even read the bill. It was, uh, it was quite a moment. So that went down, and even when Obamacare came back and tried to uh, be passed, it was very interesting because a lot of the arguments that had been used against Clinton Care the libertarian arguments were now being picked up, not just by libertarians, but by mainstream uh, 
people who really did not want to see Obamacare passed. So libertarians never took the credit for that victory, but it was there. And that's what I guess I'm, the message I want to convey to you as far as the party itself goes, and really what you're doing in New Hampshire without the party is rolling back big government. And it's wonderful because we can do it today. We do not need to get elected to do it. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not against getting elected. I think it would be great. But why wait? That's my point. Why wait if you don't have to? So basically, I think that the LP can become a power player by winning races where we can, um, making sure that uh, we do not soft sell the message, be the ghostbusters, if you will, when Big Brother comes knocking, and define winning as rolling back big government, whether it's by elections or not. Now, the nice thing about this for the LP, and something to think about as um, the Free State Project interacts with the LP, is it keeps the LP active in between times because the LP has kind of a cycle. You know, during election time it grows and then it falls after the election because there's nothing to do and there's plenty to do. So we shouldn't be in that. Um, of course, we get a chance when we're working with other people to roll back big government to share our philosophy. If you're out there working in the trenches to roll back taxes, the other people who you're working with who might not be libertarian are going to be much more open to what you have to say. And also, I want to talk about this, the upcoming nullification movement. Now, I know most of you are familiar with jury nullification, but this is not what we're talking about here. I invite you to go to this website, f4fs.org, which is uh, basically... Um, it's the uh, Foundation for a Free Society. It's, I'm the secretary. And this talks about nullification in terms of the state nullifying what the federal government is doing. This is a biggie. It's been kind of languishing all these years. Uh, this foundation made an award-winning film, a documentary about nullification, and it's really reopened the debate. There are many, many groups across the country that now want to nullify because the federal government has so many unfunded mandates that they expect the states to pay for. And part of Obamacare falls into that. So it's still being challenged, and I believe it will be challenged by the states. Also, the drug war is going to be challenged by the states. We've got two states now where they have decriminalized marijuana entirely. And you know and I know the federal government's not going to like that. They're going to try to come in there and arrest people. And there is going to be, um, there's going to be a confrontation between the states and the federal government coming up on these two issues at least. And the way I see liberty evolving as a possibility is for the states to take down the power of the federal government and then the county governments to say, you know, that was a good idea. <laughs> Let's devolve the uh, power down a little more to our level. And then, of course, the natural progression is to the individual. So this could be a very, very important thing. And I hope that you'll check it out. I want to talk a little bit about nonprofits. They're doing a great job. I'm just going to showcase a few that I happen to be involved in. Um, and I'll start with an activist nonprofit, which is basically doing the kind of things, rolling back big government that we talked about earlier, but it does it as a foundation. The way it does it, these are libertarian lawyers who take on pro bono cases, usually of disadvantaged people, the Davids, who are taking on the Goliath of big government and really winning some cases for them. Usually they're looking at economic liberty, at least that's how they started. They have made it possible for African-American hair braiders to continue and not have to get a cosmetology license. They have taken on the case of taxi cab drivers who are forbidden to do what, what they want to do by the powers that be that, of course, are beholden to the people who already have the taxi cab licenses. And they actually took eminent domain to the Supreme Court, uh, where they did lose, but uh, that created such a fervor that now there is a program in almost every state to end eminent domain abuse. And it's gotten such a reputation when IJ decides to take on a case, 
A lot of times the governments back off, so I invite you to check out their website at ij.org. Uh, I use a lot of their material when I give talks because it's so it's uh, so easy to use and shows how libertarians can really help out and be the uh, ghostbusters that uh, help you when big government comes knocking at your door. Of course, we have single issue nonprofits like FIJA, the Fully Informed Jury uh, Association, which are both activists. They pass out flyers on the courthouse steps. Many have gotten arrested. They're educational. And they've really taken jury nullification from a forgotten concept to something that's hotly debated and now taught in law school. This is a big accomplishment. Uh, and they do it on a shoestring. Check them out at Fiji.org. And of course, there's educational nonprofits like the Advocates for Self-Government. They're one of the earliest, and uh, they really promote the understanding of the non-aggression principle. They teach libertarians how to communicate the message. They distribute the world's smallest political quiz. I have done their short answers to the tough questions column for about 15 years now. Check them out at theadvocates.org. And of course, I'm currently chair of the International Society for Individual Liberty, which is a networking type of 501c3. Uh, again, unabashedly radical, another oldie, the United Nations without a nation. We do, yeah, <laughs> we do conferences. We did China last year. It was a first to get into China and talk about these things. Uh, we are doing the current one uh, in August in Luzon, Switzerland. Uh, we will be at Freedom Fest for those of you who will be there. Uh, we do liberty camps in, in different third world nations where we we call them English Liberty Camps. They take a book, uh, can be uh, Healing Our World, it could be Ken Schoolin's book, Jonathan Gullible, it can be really just about anything, and they learn English and liberty at the same time. And we've done book translations. Jonathan Gullible is now in 46 languages. Uh, I think Healing Our World's in seven. Another shoestring operation that does great things, ISIL.org. So, okay. Let's see where we are on the list that we started out in the beginning with. We've talked about projects, the Libertarian Party, nonprofits, local activism as a way to roll back big government now and not wait to be elected. And then we want to talk about a few other things that maybe aren't so obvious. So let's talk about providing solutions. Because we have so many crises coming up, the Libertarians, have a great opportunity to provide solutions. Uh, we are famous for saying no, no, no when government wants to step in, but we need to paint the picture of what liberty could bring us. And we're gonna have a great opportunity in the coming years. The healthcare crisis, and there will be one, the baby boomers are gonna retire. The healthcare system is going to break down. It would have broken down just with that, but now with Obamacare on top of it, it's going to be a total disaster. And there really is only one solution, and that is deregulation of the system. I talked about that a little bit the other day. If you didn't get a chance to see that, go ahead and pick it up on YouTube so that you know where I'm coming from there. And uh, what you'll see is that it is possible, really, to, to make health care so affordable that we don't need to have government involved or a third party insurance company or anything else. And of course, prevention. I, I want to talk about this. I, I mentioned it a little bit yesterday, but there is a whole movement that understands that the FDA and the government in general is not their friend. And these are the people who take supplements and vitamins. They know that the FDA has been trying for many, many years to regulate vitamins and supplements, and where they've been successful in other nations like Germany, it is now impossible, except by prescription, to get high-dose vitamins. And as I mentioned yesterday, as a research scientist, I found when I was doing my work before the advent of genetics that the only way I could make my animals sick was to take away their vitamins. So this is a little hint that this is an important area for health. There is a large percentage of the population out there that understands liberty on this issue. And once you understand it on one issue, 
you are a little bit more open to understanding it at every level. This is a group that we haven't brought into the movement the way we could. So you may want to be on the lookout for these people and invite them in. They are hardcore activists. When Congress tried to give the FDA authority to regulate vitamins and supplements, they got more mail both times than on any other issue. This is huge. So we need to get these people involved. We're also going to have a breakdown of Social Security as well as Medicare, and there's really only one solution. If we want to keep promises to our seniors, and I, of course I realize that a lot of people just want to repudiate that, unfortunately since almost half of our population is going to be seniors in the not too distant future, that's going to be tough. Libertarians have a solution, and that is more wealth creation. Okay, why do we have the only solution? Well, what, what the federal government's probably going to do is print more money. I, I say that, I realize it's not printing exactly, but just, it will inflate the currency. When it does that, the check that the seniors get might be the same amount, but it won't be worth anything. So the promise will be broken. Now, if they try to tax the younger generation, <laughs> the younger generation isn't going to be able to take that. They're going to rebel. And if they don't rebel, what's going to happen is that their productivity is going to drop because it's punished so badly. And once again, when the seniors get that check, it's not going to buy anything. There's only one solution, and that is to deregulate, lower taxes, and get rid of tariffs. Countries that have tried this have almost immediately gained in wealth creation. I'm going to spend a little time on this. This is a measure of wealth creation on this axis, the annual growth in the rate of GDP, gross domestic product. That sort of represents the amount of wealth that a country creates. And I know it's not the best parameter in the world, but it's, it's one we've got to work with. Now look what happens with different government spending. When government doesn't spend much, I say much, 35 to 40% is a lot to me, but less than maybe in some other countries, you notice that you have, when you have low spending, you have high GDP. Probably about twice as much as you do when there's high spending. And these three countries I'm showing you are Ireland, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. All three of these, in different periods of time, reformed because they realized they were bankrupt. And so they had a time when they went from here to here. And it was a pretty short period of time. In most cases, it was like three to five years. And then, of course, the politicians got greedy and said, oh, we've got all this wealth coming in, let's tax it again. And of course, they ended up back in, the, in a worse situation. But you see, it can happen. It happens quickly and easily. So this is the solution that libertarians have that no other group is going to be able to talk about. And because things are going to be so difficult, I think that people may finally listen. Now I want to move on to a whole other area. This is one that was tailor-made for the libertarians. And this is the field of ethics. We used to call it morality back in the... Uh, 80s, right? We've always said that libertarianism was the moral solution. Well, now they call this whole field ethics. And it's really interesting. Uh, if you look at my website, ruart.com, you'll see that I'm now billing myself, among other things, as an ethicist. And I discovered this whole field when I was in North Carolina. I was an adjunct professor uh, of biology there, the University of North Carolina in Charlotte. And what they did is they appointed me to go to their ethics committee. The ethics committee was actually made up of people from different departments. And they were trying to have programs training people to be ethicists. Uh, this is a fairly new movement. And what I found was quite startling. You know, an ethicist is supposed to go into medicine or business or some other area and consider all the different viewpoints that one might have and help the business or medical profession come to something that is workable for all those viewpoints. 
But you know, they don't have many viewpoints because they're so trained in the statist mindset that all they do is, is talk about should there be more regulation or less regulation. They don't ask the question, should there be regulation? Well, this profession is wide open. You do not need formal credentials. And if you get on LinkedIn or Facebook, you'll find a lot of discussions about these ethics. And libertarians are already starting to get involved and really turning the whole tone of these discussions around. This is something anybody can do. Libertarians, the average libertarian is much more qualified to be an ethicist than any of these people that are doing it for a profession. And the beauty of it is, if you actually get famous at it, you know, your businesses and, and places will bring you in to get your opinion and pay you. It'd be nice to be paid for spreading the word. <laughs> so, uh, I think that those of you who are, who are so inclined should look into this. This is tailor-made for us. And uh, it is something that is going to be more and more prevalent as time goes on. So check it out, please. It's an area where we can really excel. What I did for the University of North Carolina was I created a medical ethics course for the research scientists. And it was fun because I got to talk about patents. Should we have them or not? And bring things like that up. You know, uh, you got, get to talk about things like, should there be drug regulation that keeps choice away from some people? I mean, these are the issues that we bring to the table and this isn't happening anywhere else, folks. There's nobody else in the ethical field bringing this forward. Please, at least some of you, consider it seriously. And of course, uh, I want to talk about another aspect of, of what we need to succeed, and that's media. And I think here we, we actually have it. I, I don't think I really need to belabor this to this crowd. As you all know, the internet, print on demand, uh, and a number of very prominent people, uh, even on television, uh, really have made it possible for us to reach the public in a way we never could back in the 80s. In the 80s, the media effectively shut us out. And if they said anything about us, they could say things that weren't true, and we really had no way to come back. That's all changed. So we now have the new printing press, so to speak, and I think that's going to be a very valuable addition to the cause. I want to talk about the next generation, too. You know, one of the sad things that I've seen as I've been in the movement is that I'd come year after year to Libertarian Party conventions, whether it was state or national or local, and I'd look out in the audience, and, you know, they were all pretty much the baby boomers with one or two uh, new faces, younger faces. It was quite sad. That is no longer true. I think the Ron Paul Revolution activated the youth. They've got Students for Liberty and Young Americans for Liberty, which are growing faster than any other liberty organizations, including the Libertarian Party. And these are the best and the brightest. As far as I can tell, these, these young people are intelligent, hardworking, and I'm going to say team players here, but but what I mean is they also come from a mindset that's very different from my generation. I think my generation was kind of, uh, for lack of a better word, a little bit arrogant, and maybe they needed to be because of what they were up against at the time. But the new generation, the next generation coming along, I have been very impressed by. I have had people come up to me uh, at their meetings and say things like, oh, we're so grateful for you and the others that have built us such an infrastructure. We just need to walk in and be part of it, you know? You know, we really appreciate you building it. I'm shocked, you know, libertarians don't talk like that to each other normally. <laughs> but it's wonderful, and I think that attitude uh, is, is going to result, it's what's needed now. It's going to result in them pulling together and taking on a multitude of, of these types of things and really making it happen. And it needs to because their generation is just going to be destroyed by the excesses that have happened in government in recent years. So they really do need to be there. Now, I've talked about most of this list. As you can see, there's only one part I've missed. 
And that's at the very bottom, embracing our other half. What do I mean by that? Well, that's, of course, something, yes, we should do. <laughs> but that wasn't what I meant. OK. So libertarians are all about individual responsibility in the political sector. So for example, if I'm a libertarian, you would not hear me say something like, I'm poor because that guy's rich. That's not the way we react. You know, We say, I'm poor because of the fact that I haven't tried, or I'm not working hard, or I don't have the skills yet that I need to get. Uh, we might also say, and because the government's in my way, but <laughs> we wouldn't blame the rich for us being poor. We take responsibility for our condition. There is a parallel movement to ours that is largely underground. And that is the group of people that take individual responsibility for what happens in their inner world. Now, for example, most people would say, I'm angry because of what you said. But a person in this movement would say, I'm angry because of the way I think about what you said. See the difference? They take responsibility for their anger. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Can I see a show of hands? OK. Oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> you know, I, I don't have enough time to go into the details of this movement other than to say this is a parallel movement where people take responsibility for their inner self. And since a lot of you are acquainted with it, I just like to say it's our other half. And it's our, I've, I've had my foot in both camps for a long time. And I know many of you have come up to me and said, oh, you know, it's so great to meet you. And, and, and some people with tears in their eyes because there's just something, they feel there's some connection there with me. And it's not really, it's not really about me. It's about, it's about what comes through in healing our world. It's about that part of the responsibility. It's, it, it's about, well, for lack of a better word, I'm going to say a loving attitude. Okay, there's, there's a part of that movement that has something that we're missing. And so for those of you who, are, who know what I'm talking about, I suggest, if you wish, to become more acquainted with it and get those people in our movement. Because right now, we are divided. You know, to only think in self-responsibility about the outer world and not think about our inner world. It's not balanced, and vice versa. Many of them think about the inner world, but they don't recognize that aggression, they don't recognize aggression when they see that, and that's what we bring to them. Once you tell those people what taxation really is, they're libertarian. I went to a conference many years ago when I first put out Healing Our World, I was there for two weeks, a conference with such people, and I did not speak. But myself and others put their books out on the table, and by the end of the conference, 50%, half of the people walked home with a copy of Healing Our World. And I said not a word, because they recognized the parallel when they picked up the book. They are our other half. And I'm so glad to see that so many of you know who I'm talking about so that you can investigate a little more and invite them into the fold because we have something they need, the individual responsibility in the outer world, and they have something we need, the inner responsibility in our inner world. And I think that part of the difficulty my generation has had in getting things off the ground has been they haven't had that perspective. So I hope that uh, you might at least consider these comments. And if some of them resonate with you, go for it. Because we need every perspective that we can, every project for liberty, every angle. They are all important. So thank you for all you do for liberty. Thank you. We can take some questions for Dr. Roy.
Qu got a question, just raise your hand. Hi there. So for those of us who don't know what other half you're talking about, what <laughs> Sorry, I should, have, I should have been more explicit. Okay, what's this other half? Well, it's, some people call it a spiritual movement. It's sometimes called New Age. It's not really, um, it's not really easily definable. But it's, uh, there is a movement where people look at what's going on inside them, look at their emotions, and instead of blaming others, realize, oh, you know, I'm thinking about this a certain way. You can um, go into any bookstore in the self-help section and you will see books by some of these authors and some of them are more, um, how can I say it, they take it deeper than others. <laughs> what will appeal to you at whatever um, perspective you're currently coming from is hard for me to say. But I would just, I would, a good start is to go to the bookstore and thumb through some books in the self-help section and see what speaks to you. Or talk to your other fellow libertarians who raise their hand, and they may, uh, they may have some recommendations for you. I definitely like the idea of coalition building. And um, I was just recently at a meeting of the San Francisco Tesla Society, where Foster Gamble of the Thrive Movement was speaking. And I think, you know, I'm not affiliated with the Thrive Movement in any sort of official way, but I think that what they're doing is really interesting and could really work towards building coalitions because they're just basically trying to take a 12 sec they call it a 12 sector approach to breaking down each of the, the different sectors of society that the state has kind of taken control of and saying, how can we break free of this? And they're bringing a lot of interesting people into the fold, people who aren't, have, never, you know, have nothing to do with the, the liberty movement explicitly, but you know, internally they just have this drive towards freedom and liberty and uh, wanted to you know, mention that and get your thoughts. You know, are you familiar with the Thrive Movement? What do you think yes. of that? Yes. Yes. Uh, for those who didn't hear that clearly, there's a movie on the internet called Thrive, which you can view for free. And I would say it's a, a I think it, I, it was, it's made by people who are, I think, somewhat in this movement I'm talking about for inner responsibility, but they've also recognized that there needs to be this outer responsibility. And they're, the way they're going about things is largely libertarian. There are a few areas where maybe they need a little bit of, uh, um, of our advice. And um, that's, that's something we can give. You know, one thing libertarians do is we think about liberty a lot. So when someone is only halfway there, we can help take them the rest of the way. And that's very beautiful. So I, I really recommend that you see that movie and, and see if it speaks to you, and maybe you can get involved in that group. I mean, there are a lot of groups out here that are doing that. And when you get involved in another group, you can bring them into the Liberty Group, and it's a way to go. Dr. Ruart, uh, my name is Daryl W. Perry. You know me. I've met you several times over the years. Uh, a lot of libertarians care about ballot access and a lot of Republicans and Democrats that are elected and a lot of small L libertarians that are within those two parties just, you know, they, they tell the libertarian activists, well, just run as a Republican. And I've tried, I actually have a book published, Duopoly, How the Republicrats Control the Electoral Process, to explain how the Republicans and Democrats, you know, basically keep out alternative voices. But do you have anything that you suggest on how to convince those small L libertarians within the major parties why we need ballot access? And do you have any magic words to tell the state reps that support us a lot, but just say, run within the Republicans, we don't need alternative voices? Well, you know, I think that's a very individual thing. So if, I think that it probably is appropriate for some small L libertarians to run as Democrats and Republicans, frankly. But I also think it's important for uh, people to run as libertarians because we have a different opportunity as libertarians. For those who are willing to schmooze, raise the money, and um, really uh, play politics, if you will, like Ron Paul, for example, I mean, I think that may be the place. But for those of us who want to give the message out, who really are dedicated to the message, you cannot do it <laughs> unless you run as a libertarian. And for me, that is the most 
convincing reason to run as a libertarian. It's the reason I run as a libertarian. I'm not willing to get up and soft sell the message. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, the need for ballot access. I would appeal to their sense of fairness. You want to be fair, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> what are they going to say? No, I don't want to. Well, you don't really need that other. Oh, so you're, you're afraid of another voice. You know, I would just kind of hit them that way. <laughs> show, them, show them what they're really saying. <laughs> uh, Dr. Ruart, you talked about how up here, center. Oh, I'm sorry. No. Hiding <laughs> back here. Uh, you talked about how you, I guess, are a little bit disappointed about the Libertarian Party uh, soft selling, I guess, as we were just talking about. And mm -hmm. I think one of the things that some of us have encountered as activists is that when we've tried to do, sometimes on a personal level, a hard sale, we just get immediate, utter rejection of the ideas, and they don't want to even hear anything anymore. And so I kind of understand why the Libertarian Party politically, when they're talking to a broad audience, wants to do the soft sell. And I was wondering if you could comment sure. on, on that. You know, it is, it is I, will not, um, I will not claim that it is easy to sell our message because it is so radical that, and so different from what the mainstream is, obviously there's issues there. And that's why I brought up the Advocates for Self-Government. They do a really good job in showing you how to deal with the tough issues so you don't turn your audience off. And the reality is there are going to be some people you can only take so far at that particular point in time. The skill of, of a good communicator is recognizing where that point is. And, you know, I always try to look for a place where someone is actually libertarian. And everybody is in some way, I think. There's, there's an issue on which they don't want the government to interfere with them. And, of course, that's why I mentioned the people with the supplements and vitamins, because they are, they are so strong on that, they really get it in that area. So once you find that point where the person is a libertarian, then it's much easier to say, well, you see, that's sort of like this, and then you take them to the next step. Now, again, especially with family members and friends, sometimes you just have to back off. I mean, I have family and friends that I really am very, uh, I just don't bring it up, or I'm very gentle with it because they're, you know, family and friends tend to get extremely defensive. You know, we may not be the best ambassador for our family and friends. It may be that it's easier with strangers. It just depends. And, and it's a skill that you learn. And sometimes it's trial and error and we goof. But you just keep at it. You just keep at it. Experience is really the key. Oh, okay, yes. Um, I need to wrap up because the next speaker is ready. And um, I just want to thank you again for your attention. I hope I've stimulated some thought and given you some ideas. I will, I will. And uh, I will be available afterwards outside for a little bit if you have further questions. Thank Mary you. Mary Surprise!